This coming Tuesday is the official first day of spring. And yet, for many of us, we're still facing at least another month of being in the cold and having to stay inside. In addition, several of the major U.S. newspapers wrote about the four-year anniversary of COVID being Monday, March 11th, 2024. This is the sequel to my first episode on COVID, which was episode 17. And in this episode, we're talking about prevention what we know about it now, what's in the research, and prominent myths and misinformation going around about the prevention methods we have today. Although COVID is still very much a thing, very few experts are talking about it now. And at the same time, it's being left up to individuals to keep themselves educated and understand the situation. Granted, we're moving out of cold and flu season. You'll find this information useful throughout the year, and it'll be a good place for you to start when we come back into the season. And even if you're not interested in the COVID research, stick around for the beginning of the episode because I'm going to give a few leadership lessons that we can all take from this COVID communication conundrum. I'll also be giving a few pointers on how to put research into perspective when you hear about it in the media. And hopefully that'll help you to navigate your health decisions more confidently, not just around COVID, but any other kind of health topic. I got a lot of questions and comments from episode 17, and I'm incorporating them into this segment. I'll cover what I found in the research about masks, do they work? Vaccines, are they dangerous? Boosters, Do we need them? And a few things you might not have thought about when it comes to preventing detriments of this virus and others. And in case you didn't hear episode 17, you may be asking why we care about prevention. Well, what I did say in that episode was that COVID is not a cold or a flu. And even though the symptoms we're having when we catch it are minimal, For many, the breakdown of our body happens silently in the background, even if you're healthy. And you don't need to have serious acute symptoms to end up with long COVID. So if you want to catch up on that, go ahead to episode 17. And yes, even after four years, it does need to be something that we're paying attention to. I'm Lucy Gable, integrative leadership coach and trainer author, speaker, and professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine grad program. And this is my podcast, Leadership, Life, Health, and Happiness. What I say in this episode isn't health advice. I also don't speak for the university where I teach. I'm giving you information that I gathered from research that I did for myself over the last few months. So you can add this to your knowledge base to make informed decisions in the future. There are a couple leadership lessons in this topic that I want to cover first thing, because we shouldn't give up the chance to learn from all of the conundrums that happen in our lives, right? Leaders of organizations know most of all that not investigating all sides of an issue is a sure path to failure. That's exactly what allows a competitor to come in and knock them out of business because their eyes were closed to certain angles. We need to pay attention to all sides of an issue with the same level of curiosity and attention. It's the only route to the best decisions. In that same vein, we've got to pay attention to all angles of information about COVID because it's the only route to the best decisions. You're probably well aware of the communication challenges around this topic, not just in the US, but in the world. It's become a loaded, controversial, political topic. People have chosen sides, and when we're emotionally attached to our side, it can blind us from seeing the best decisions. Successful leaders have to lead difficult conversations all the time. They do it because they know there's a lot of value in bringing everyone to the table and listening to people with a variety of background experiences and opinions. 
You may have encountered some really difficult conversations around this topic within your organization or friends or family. Contrary to popular belief, when you dive into difficult conversations and do it the right way, you can actually build stronger relationships and a stronger sense of community and collaboration to help you navigate these kinds of discussions. I'm going to give a few secrets that leaders use to be successful in leading difficult conversations. First, make sure everyone feels heard. Give people time to say their points and always look for areas you agree on first before talking about how you disagree. Second, make sure no one feels like they're being ostracized or invalidated for what they have to say. It's the only way to get all the information onto the table so we can look at it and decide what we're going to use and what we're going to act on. If you're interested in learning more about this, episode 10 titled Healthy Conflict, has techniques and some data around having difficult conversations in a successful way. Meanwhile, I'm doing my best to be a good example of discussing this highly conflictual topic in a balanced way so no one listening feels invalidated. I'd like to continue the conversation and have as many people benefit as possible. You are welcome to put your thoughts and experiences and questions in the comments. And if you do, see if you can practice these tips to encourage a collaborative discussion and learning environment. Now, it's one thing to get the information. It's another thing to understand it so you can use it for your benefit. Let's talk a little bit about science before we dive into the research today. Science isn't a belief system. It's not political or emotional. It's a way to study how things work. If we want to get the best information from science, we need to look at it without emotion. We need to separate it from our hopes and fears. This is one of the fundamentals I learned when I first got into research, and it's now what I teach students. We need to look at research and data without expectations, desires, or emotional attachment. That's the only way we can see what science and numbers and data truly has to show us. It's like polishing a diamond, like taking the dirt off and looking at it for exactly what it is. There are many people today talking about research to the public who weren't trained in science. And many times they end up misunderstanding things or overlapping their own emotional and belief systems onto the science and creating misinformation. I want you to be able to avoid falling into the trap of misinformation. I'm going to give you three fundamental points to remember that'll help you put research into perspective when you hear about it on the news, when you see social media, or read it in books, or watch it on TV. And you can use these three points to make the smartest possible decisions about the information you're getting. I'm going to be referring to these points when I talk about the research in the last segment of this episode. So you might want to take some notes. First, human health science is not binary. It's never just yes or no, black or white, red or green, stop or go. It's not binary because every human has different lifestyles, including nutrition and sleep and exercise habits lives in different environmental situations, has slightly different genetics, has been exposed to different illnesses, and has different immune systems and immune reactions. So the way COVID affects any individual depends on the interplay of all these different factors. The virus is also changing. The strain someone catches also plays a part in how someone will react and the experience they'll have with it. Since there are so many different factors at play with humans, there won't be a one-size-fits-all answer to how someone should handle COVID. So that's point number one. Point number two is one study never answers the whole question because every human is different. Every study usually looks at a few angles of the question, but it's physically impossible to address every angle. We need many different studies to look at many different angles before we can start to see the real picture of how things work. 
As a very simple example, you might hear about a study that looked at COVID in females between the ages of 20 and 40 who live in Southern California and exercise at least three times a week. Now you can see that this study doesn't cover everything. We need more studies because it doesn't tell us anything about females under 20 or over 40. Females who don't exercise, males of all ages and exercise levels. And incidentally, if you're living in Southern California, you might have a different lifestyle from people who live in New York. So that's another factor that has to be looked at with other studies. Do these women react the same as people in New York, people in India and in Asia and Africa, right? We don't know until we have more studies. So when you're listening to information about a study, don't just listen to what the information says, listen to what it does not say. And that's the only way you can decide if a research study actually applies to you. So if we want to get an idea about where the research stands now on something, are we supposed to read all of the research that's out there? Well, not necessarily. There's one kind of a study called a meta-analysis. It's also called a review paper. And these are reports that will take many studies into account, evaluate them, and then give you an overview of what's been found up to now. And I'll have some in this episode today. The final point I have is correlation does not mean causation. Translated, that means just because something happens in close proximity to something else, it doesn't mean that one caused the other. Let's say for the first time ever, I ate a pizza from a company called O one night. And the next morning, I felt tired and my knee gave out as I was stepping over a curb and I twisted my ankle. Can I say the pizza made me twist my ankle? Well, I'm thinking most of you are saying absolutely not, but why not? You see, we usually don't draw conclusions like this with anything else, but too many people have been doing exactly this when it comes to COVID. When we look back at something after it happened to one person, after the fact, when we hadn't been taking detailed notes on all the possible things that were happening to them, all we have are things that are correlated. Going back to the pizza example. What we don't know is whether I twisted my ankle because of the new brand of pizza I ate, because I was tired that morning, or was it because of the wine I drank? Or was it because I didn't sleep well the night before? Or was it because of the hard workout I had the day earlier that made my legs tight and hurt? See, there's a lot of other information that I didn't tell you that you wouldn't have known unless I did. So we don't really know if something caused something else until we test it in a research style experiment. And luckily, in the case of COVID, there are many different institutions and universities and countries around the world contributing to research like this. So to bring it all together, the three main points of research we need to remember are the human health science is never binary, that one study never answers the whole question, and correlation does not equal causation. What I mentioned in episode 17 was that COVID is not a cold or the flu. Even though at this time it may feel that way, the effects of COVID are at this time flying under the radar. COVID attacks your heart, lungs, blood vessels, and mitochondria of your blood. Mitochondria are the energy producing, metabolizing systems of your cells. And COVID can stick around long after the symptoms have gone and continue to do damage to these areas. Approximately 7% of the people in the U.S. have reported long COVID, which is 23 million people as of September last year. Even in healthy people, it goes to these areas and breaks parts of your body down. And if you are health conscious, the last thing you want to happen is for some virus to come and knock out a certain percentage of your cardiovascular health, your lung capacity, your ability to turn oxygen and fuel into energy, and your brain performance. 
what's the best way not to get long COVID? Well, to not get COVID in the first place. What do we know about how to protect ourselves from this today? I did a deep dive into this question as well, and I'm going to provide all of the references to all of the studies that I talk about in the description of this podcast. And to help me fill in the gaps, I also talked to Dr. Misha Kogan, a practicing medical doctor and director of the GW Center for Integrative Medicine. He's also a two-time author and founder of the AIM Health Institute in Washington, D.C. He's been speaking to the public about COVID research since the beginning of the pandemic, and his links will also be in the description. I told Dr. Kogan about the research I was finding on long COVID, and he said it was spot on. He's not really seeing people for COVID anymore. It's mainly people with long COVID that are coming in. And we established in episode 17 that you don't have to get a bad case of COVID in order for it to be a bad case of long COVID. I'm still hearing a lot of people questioning forms of prevention. So let's get into it. Do masks work? When I looked into studies on masks, almost 4,000 results came up for the research within the last three years. And I know that there is so much out there in the social media saying that masks don't work. What does the research say? The 2024 meta-analyses I found offered the following numbers. First, cloth masks work, but they provide the least protection and they're still something. They provide about 21% reduced risk. Second, surgical masks decrease infection by about 49%. And finally, N95 masks decrease infection by about 69%. So again, these were two meta-analyses from 2024. I also asked Dr. Kogan about masks. I figured, what better than to ask someone whose life and health depends on it? And his response was, masks are one of the top preventive methods we have today. He said, as doctors, we've been exposed to all kinds of illness. I rely on my mask and my glasses. He also said, it's not that masks don't work. They just don't work 100%. So in his office, his patients wear a mask too, and that increases the effectiveness. So for example, if you're in a closed room with someone who has COVID, and you don't have a mask and they don't have a mask, there's nothing in between your breathing and the microscopic virus particles that enter your nose or mouth. But if you wear a mask, it reduces the particles that get into your nose and mouth. If that person is also wearing a mask, it reduces the number of their particles that reach you. So that's your second layer of protection. And the better mask you have, the more particles it reduces. And we know that the amount of particles you breathe and the amount of time you spend breathing them will determine how intense you get the virus when you get it. He said you want it to cover your chin, your mouth, and your nose, and have as little air holes on the side as possible. He also said this is the easiest form of protection. Masks are easy to carry around and have on hand, and if you find yourself in an area that you think may be high risk, you just pop one on. Aside from masks, There are some antiviral nasal sprays that are being tested that could be promising, and they seem to offer about six hours of protection from the time that you spray. And there's not a whole lot of research on it, but I do know that people are experimenting with them anyway. How do we decide when and whether to wear a mask? There's a new phrase for what we're doing these days. It's called strategic masking. Here's a very loose example for you. Not scientific at all, but it is how you can think about virus particles. Take a glass of water. The glass represents the room you're in. Put one shake of pepper into the water. If the pepper were COVID particles in the room, this is what it might look like if they were visible. And that one shake of pepper is what it might look like if... There was one person in the room with COVID. Put another shake of pepper into the water, and that would be two people. Put one last shake, and that'll be three. 
So the pepper will swirl around if you move the water. It'll also settle down to the bottom of the glass after a while. So the more people and the smaller the room, especially if it's a closed room, the more dense the particles are going to be in the air and the more likely you're going to be breathing in more particles. Whereas if you go outside, that's more like putting those three shakes of pepper into a bathtub or a pool. The more an infected person is talking, the more particles are going to flow from their mouth. And coughs and sneezes propel more particles out of the infected person's mouth and nose and propel them further into the air. So as you look ahead to what you're going to be doing, you have to evaluate the circumstances and decide what the situation is and decide what you're comfortable with. We can just expect more people to be wearing masks. It's just going to be something that we see. And there's a lot of controversy and even judgment still going on about masks. We need to drop that. We don't know why someone's wearing a mask. They could be sick and not want to give their germs to you, or they could have a life situation that makes them susceptible to getting sick with anything. They could have someone in their life that they're caring for and they need to stay well. And personally, I'll be flying to the East Coast next week. I'll be wearing a mask on that plane. I know planes have strong filters, but if anyone next to me is sick in any way, I just don't want my fun trip to turn into sick time in bed when I get home. And if you are ever self-conscious about wearing a mask, you might adopt my sentiment, which is I'm the only one experiencing my body when it's throwing up, sweating from a fever, pounding with a headache, aching with a sore throat. So I get to decide how much exposure I want and everyone else gets to decide theirs. That's the stance I'm taking when I go to the airport in a couple days. The next form of prevention is vaccination. And I know there are people of all kinds of opinions about vaccinations listening in right now. So remember what I said in the beginning about getting all the information you can in order to make the best decision you can. There's no harm in listening here. And then you can put my info into your knowledge toolbox for later use if necessary. The virus is still mutating. The current most common version is very different from the first and even second and third versions that we had in the beginning of the pandemic. There are still many people who have not been vaccinated. And I see it as having three major reasons. One, there's still a big fear that vaccines are dangerous. Two, there's a rumor that vaccines don't work. And three, there are people that are saying they keep you out of the hospital, but they won't keep you from getting the virus. So if you're not in an older age group or immune suppressed, then why get the vaccine? And from what I'm seeing in the research, these are all big misunderstandings. And I'll share with you the research that I found. Let's tackle the first one, the fear that vaccinations are dangerous. In the early phases of the vaccine, some people had adverse effects that were very worrisome. Did these adverse effects happen? Yes. Were there a lot of them? No. In my research, I found no recent study about these things. I had to go back to 2022 to find the most recent study. What this means is we've moved on in the research. We've got enough out of what we studied already, and there's no need to study it anymore. The most recent studies show that severe side effects of the vaccine are rare and much less than getting the actual virus. A study in March 2022 screened 107 publications for reactions to the Pfizer vaccine and found people who reported one or more side effects. They reported from the highest to lowest incidence, fatigue, muscle pain, headache, joint pain, chills, fever, itching, swelling lymph nodes, nausea, dizziness, and diarrhea. And the side effects were the same kind of effects you'd expect from vaccines of this nature. And they found that females had more adverse responses than males. The European Review for Medical and Pharmacological Sciences did a sweeping review of contraindications in 2021 looking for adverse effects of the Pfizer 
and Moderna vaccines and found the same thing. And they concluded that people with high risk of negative reactions to the vaccine are those with a known history of severe allergic reactions to vaccines, as well as immunocompromised people and individuals receiving immunosuppressive therapy. When we were just starting out, three medical conditions were reported as correlated to receiving the COVID-19 vaccines, aside from the normal side effects you always hear about from vaccines of this nature. And I'm going to jog your memory to go back to point number three from our discussion about science, because correlation does not necessarily mean causation. So let's talk about the three problems that happened in the beginning. One was thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, or TTS. Boy, that sounds scary, right? It's a rare syndrome of blood clotting, and this was found with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We also know that thrombosis and clotting are a symptom of COVID. In August 2021, the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices published a study, and they found that out of 187 million people in the United States who received at least one dose of the vaccine, 38 were reported for TTS. If you're talking about 38 people out of 187 million people, that's 0.00002% chance. It's such a small number, you can't even imagine how small it is. Now, out of 12.6 million Johnson & Johnson vaccines gives you one in 300,000 percent chance if you got that vaccine. Now, as a reference point, your chance of dying in a car accident is 16 in 100,000. That's a 48 times higher chance. That means each time you drive in your car, there's a 48 times greater possibility of dying than getting one of these reactions with a vaccine or booster. And we willingly take that chance multiple times per day. And that's why I decided that I personally was going to be just fine getting the vaccine. I was okay with taking that chance because it was so small. The second major problem in the beginning was Julian Barr syndrome a rare autoimmune nerve disorder that's characterized by weakness and paralysis. And that also was reported with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. A large study in 2023 reviewed data from 3 million patients aged 16 years or older, and it showed that getting COVID is associated with an increased risk of this syndrome, and the vaccine is associated with a decreased risk. We can also go back to the study published in August 2021 with 187 million people, and there were 100 cases of this syndrome. It occurred mostly in males around 50 to 64 years old. Doing the math, that's one in two million chance that one would come down with this. That is 0.00005% another very, very small number. If you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, then your risk was one in 120,000, and the chance of dying in a car accident is 20 times greater. Finally, myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, was reported after Pfizer or Moderna vaccination, particularly after the second dose, and mainly in males aged 18 to 29 years old. Myocarditis is also a risk factor when you get COVID. Out of 141 million second mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, 497 reports of myocarditis. That's one in 300,000 chance. And again, the chance of dying in a car accident is 48 times greater. And we willingly take that chance multiple times per day. Many people are still very worried about the mRNA vaccine because of the genetic piece. 
when I first heard about it, I was actually quite excited because I studied genetics in undergrad and grad school and part of what I teach today. So I understand how things work and I just want to share that with you. mRNA does not influence your DNA. mRNA is something your DNA makes. It doesn't go back to your DNA and it has a temporary lifespan. It doesn't last forever because the mRNA is what our body uses to build protein. And after it builds a certain amount of protein, the mRNA gets dissolved. It has to. Otherwise, we would be rolling around the streets like a giant ball of protein if our body didn't stop producing that. So if you're concerned about it changing your DNA or making that protein forever, that's not how it works. So let's talk about boosters. People are saying boosters don't prevent you from getting sick. They'll prevent you from going to the hospital. They'll protect you from death. But if you're not at serious risks, then they aren't going to do anything for you. You might as well get COVID. Does it keep you from getting sick in general from COVID? When I looked into COVID booster effectiveness, there were 2,820 studies on PubMed. Almost all of the recent research I found, studies from both Europe and the United States, showed that boosters are effective. They do reduce the risk of infection and lower the risk of serious illness and death. The virus is changing. Strains are different. A vaccine that you got against one strain of the virus isn't going to work against the new strains, sometimes not at all, and at least not as well. That's why boosters have been recommended. One meta-analysis looked at 1,174 studies running all the way up to November 2023, just a few months ago. And the total number of participants in the studies ended up being 39,673,160 people. And it showed that the bivalent vaccines, aka the bivalent boosters, are approximately 30% better than the monovalent vaccines at preventing symptomatic infections. They were almost 40% better at preventing illness, almost 60% better at preventing hospitalizations, and 72% better at preventing deaths. It showed that these newest vaccines, aka boosters, are effective. The COVID Real-Time Learning Network did an early estimate study regarding the effectiveness of the current vaccine against the current strain between September 2023 and January 2024. And they looked at 9,222 total tests and found overall vaccine effectiveness among adults over 18 was 54% at an average of 52 days after vaccination. And between 60 and 120 days after vaccination, it was about 40 to 60% protection. So they concluded that the most current updated vaccines, aka boosters, provide protection against symptomatic infection, including against the currently circulating lineages, which are JN1. So there are real reasons to consider getting a vaccine. If you're going to get a booster once a year, you would probably want to time it to around that COVID season, right? Which is happens to be the same as flu season and RSV season. And I will say that after talking with Dr. Kogan and after looking into a little bit of the research, I didn't dive into this one, but it seems like you really should wait two weeks in between vaccines. So if you were going to get your COVID shot and your flu shot, get them two weeks apart. And also you want to get these shots when you're in a good immune place, when you're not already sick from something or already fighting something. Other things to consider when you're thinking about prevention from any harsh detrimental effects from covid or any other virus or illness. First, cardiovascular exercise strengthens your heart and blood vessels and lungs. Cardiovascular exercise makes your cells better at accepting oxygen, better at metabolism, 
improves your mental functions. It also reduces your risk of countless other issues that we know COVID weighs in on. When you start from an exceptionally good place, if you get hit with something and it knocks you down, you're going to be much better off. The food you eat also matters. Every plant food has its very own signature of antioxidants and phytonutrients that protect your heart and your blood vessels and your brain. And they support your immune system and promote repair of your tissues. On the other side, ultra processed food contains high levels of sugar and salt and unhealthy fats chemicals and preservatives that will interfere with the function of your blood vessels and the optimal workings of your heart and brain. And when we eat ultra processed foods, we're naturally eating less of the healthy food that we need for optimal performance. So make sure you're eating more of the healthy stuff and much less of the unhealthy stuff. Whether you exercise and what you eat are part of how you can make your genes 10 to 15, possibly even 20 years younger. And when you go into anything with a genetically younger body and brain, that generally means you're more resilient. One more thing you might not think about, and that is to make sure you include in your life doing some things that make you happy. We know that when we experience happiness, Hormones that heal and repair are circulated through your body and brain. And we don't think about that as much as we should when we talk about total health, but it's significantly important and it's turning up to be something that also can affect the health and the longevity of your DNA. So exercise and food and experiencing happiness seem so simple, but the simplest, most basic self-care is what so many are not doing. And take it from me, as I've seen it change the lives of so many clients and customers in my lifetime of working in the health arena. They seem like the smallest things, and they really are, but they provide so much benefit once you just get started. And finally, because I was sick for a while when I had COVID, I want to pass something that I experienced on to you. When we get sick, It can be easy to go all the way to the worst possible outcomes in your mind, and we can get depressed about it. But remember, there are infinity outcomes, and many of them include you getting better and continuing to live an amazing life. So if you're going to put any mental energy into thinking about an outcome after you get sick, you'll fare best by putting your mental energy into thinking about the best possible scenario. Thanks for sticking with me. If you like this episode, give it a like or five stars. Share it with someone if you think they'll be interested. This is Lucy Gable. I'll talk to you next time.